Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Reimagining Tech in 2022, presented by Google Cloud and ETCIO. To help IT decision makers in meeting digital transformation goals for their organizations, ET and Google Cloud have come up with an innovative series of 10 workshops and cutting edge cloud technologies. The sessions have been conceptualized, keeping in mind IT leaders who are looking to gain actionable insights to support their organization's digital growth strategies. Today's workshop is on the topic Applied AI, translating early hype into sustainable business growth. Artificial intelligence AI is transforming industries and solving important real world challenges at scale. According to McKinsey, in less than 10 years, AI may be the number one driver of global GDP growth. This is a staggering prediction. Over the next decade, we will see incredible adoption and innovation. In fact, applications that aren't AI enabled may feel broken. This workshop has been designed to offer a conceptual toolkit to help organizations realize the full potential of AI while balancing critical questions around its applications and use cases. Let's kickstart today's event. I would like to invite Mr. Venu Gopal Murli Prabhu, Vice President, Context Center Transformation Automation, Next Gen CC Solutions, Concentrix for a keynote address. Welcome, Mr. Prabhu. Pleasure to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the workshop, so you can keep posting your questions and our speakers will be happy to take them all. Now over to you, Mr. Prabhu. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking time to be part of this session. Before we get it started, a quick introduction about myself. This is Venugopal here. I am in the CX space for more than two decades now, and I've been part of various digital transformation engagements across globally. When it comes to digital transformation, AI is one of the standard topic that we keep exploring and enabling for clients. When I say AI, I'm referring to applied AI and not the general one. Applied AI is one of the hot topic in the market right now. It's rapidly moving away from the laboratory into many applications as we speak. The result is a fundamental shift in how software is being built, the solutions are being ideated, and what is capable of doing now and how it's being used in the industry. Okay, before we talk any further, let me give a quick glimpse on applied AI. So what is it? Applied AI is the use of artificial intelligence to enhance and extend software applications. This includes various components. First and foremost is AI algorithm, data, quality data, I mean, then the code or the underlying logic and the orchestration layer, and the feedback loop that's essential for AI to work effectively. And last but not the least, an user interface, and again, it can be optional. In the past, there were many organizations found it challenging to get started with AI because it's perceived to be a complex topic, but now things are changing. Organizations are certainly exploring AI in one way or the other. Trust me, it's in the right direction. Having spent many years in CX space, I would confine my conversations around CX and AI here. There are many consumer applications, and I can give many examples. So gaming, media, entertainment, if you take a look at it, Netflix, Amazon Prime became our friend in the past two years, thanks to lockdown. And they are using AI for personalization. What programs you like based on what genre and type you saw. Educational, right? This is another area where it has seen a huge influx of AI and how it's transforming the way the educational groups are harnessing it. There are many products out there for personalized learning experience, course content, and so on. And last but not the least, and my favorite topic is a customer service. Can you believe noise cancellation nowadays are using AI? Conversational AI is another big topic in the customer service space. It's pretty common. 
and it's gaining good momentum. And these do exist in different forms and form factors. These applications, at least the new age ones, if you see, AI is embedded in one way or the other. AI helps application to provide more personalized consumer engagement. Most organizations nowadays have marketing, sales, and service pillar to serve their consumers. AI plays a pivotal role across these pillars. For example, now we can do a more powerful and personalized marketing. We call it as reach with richness. Think of sales, pricing strategies, helping consumers find the best price and the right price for a quick closure. Think of services. There are many applications of AI. Next best action, better customer engagement, predictive support, and so on, the way the services industry is harnessing the AI. We are in a competitive world, and AI adds efficacy, intelligence, and competitive advantage at every touch point, and organizations are aligned on this. So for organizations, this is not just another activity. Rather, it is a mandate to drive it. Recent data points published states, Indian firms alone are accounting 67% of bot deployment compared to 21% worldwide. 93% of the organizations are planning to increase the AI budget by next year, 2023. And about two thirds of the companies are expanding their AI funding by 25% or more in the coming years. And again, this is also clear from the kind of inquiries we are seeing in the market and what customers are actually looking at. Of late, many customers are asking for, hey, I need automation and AI based conversations to engage my customers in every possible way. Hyper personalization, conversational IVR, chatbot, next best action, document processing are very common. Though it's in the hype cycle, this is gaining momentum. Trust me, in the next couple of years, these are going to become a standard offerings. While there are many organizations that have started the journey, they are yet to scale. And there are many more who have not even started the journey. And I see a great opportunity for all of us to come together, enable them, and bring the right value of AI in the mix. So while we talk about AI, scaling AI is critical. To scale, you got to do skill enablement, bring in new talent, identification of right use cases, quick proof of concept, agile methodologies, and partnering with industry leaders. And in fact, you should also partner with the regional players are critical in this journey. It's a journey, as I said, and things are evolving every second. If you don't plan it, this won't gain momentum at all. My recommendations to you and to my clients, at least start small, but do it faster. AI is efficient and accurate as the data dictates and using the right algorithm. Data quality is quite key here. Garbage in, garbage out. Organizations need to spend time in ensuring the quality data. Hire right data engineers, data scientists, and have the right data strategy. That's very, very critical to get to the better quality of data. So let's talk about the tech advancements in this space. While there are so many things that are happening, I'm going to confine myself into the customer experience, and consumer applications here. Wearable AI. We all use wearables in one way or the other. Data collected from these systems have immense insights. And trust me, healthcare providers, wellness experts, insurance companies are actually harnessing this for providing personal care. And this is happening. It is picking momentum. It's just that we need to accept. The second important advancement I would like to talk about is fraud prevention and detection. Before AI, the fraud prevention systems would typically use 
a very rule based and they analyze the past fraud patterns without providing much insights into future but with the ai we can combine the supervised learning algorithms trained on historical data coupled with the unsupervised learning organizations are gaining a greater level of clarity and they can make better decisions thanks to ai biometrics face and voice recognition behind the hood if you really see they use ai and they are gaining momentum the third important area when it comes to tech advancement i want to talk about is conversational ai no one thought that this would gain momentum earlier the market size for conversational ai was around 6.8 billion as of 2021 and it's growing at 22% right so the industry projection is by 2026 it's going to become 18.4 billion dollars and trust me this is really picking banks many insurance companies healthcare providers are leveraging conversational ai so what drives the growth what i am seeing is there is an increased demand of ai powered contact center customer support ecosystem and omni channel deployment reduced conversational ai deployment cost usage fees these are driving some of the adoption that the conversational ai is looking at emotion analysis nlp nlu they are all part and parcel of this they can't split this the other important thing that i want to talk about is predictive personalization so we spoke about little earlier on netflix an ai powered customer service they use solid ai algorithms such as demographics viewing history the personal preferences to predict what the user would like to watch next with a greater level of accuracy and there was an industry study that shows that with this ai they were able to save a billion dollars in a year for retaining the customers another example that i can quote here is sprint a telecom in north america they had a lot of challenges in terms of retention of the customers they used ai to provide more personalized offerings that has actually improved their retention rate and the sprint case study is not new it's pretty old and they have been leveraging ai for quite some time the next topic that i want to talk about is about computer vision it's a great area that has evolved a lot in the past 2 years i personally interested in this because this has got immense potential it's about processing and analyzing the digital images and videos to automatically understand the meaning and the context what's the intent how do i get the data automatically can it run 24 cross 7 the accuracy of this recognition engines have evolved significantly in the last few quarters they can identify the object classify the objects and even identify parts of the objects it is phenomenal so nowadays lot of banks are coming up with kyc know your customers they are harnessing ai many banks i can quote both indian as well as international banks they are doing nowadays kyc in a jiffy how it happens it's all powered by computer vision behind the scene so while we have been talking about the customer facing side of it i also strongly feel the call center agents they are also leveraging ai to large extent be it training the agents how do we talk to different set of customers different personas of customers ai is being used to measure the productivity how do we motivate the agents what training needs to be done ai is being leveraged agent assist tools the decision support tools 
we are leveraging AI and industry is leveraging AI. And one more important topic when it comes to tech advancement is the recent gig about metaverse. It's a fascinating technology, to be honest. It's a great way of engaging people in this virtual world, training customer conversations, concurrent conversations, being omnipresent, interactive media. These are some of the art of possible. And trust me, this is going to evolve. And this is something that I request all of you to watch out. And the use cases are being identified. Technologies are being explored. It's a great place to invest, learn, and expand. So in summary, AI is no more a hype. It is supporting the organizations in sustaining the growth. And it is picking up and we need to move fast. So what do you got to do? You got to enable the team, get the quality data, identify use cases, start small, but fast and scale up. Further, be ready to tweak the journey. With that said, thanks for taking time once again. Hope it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prabhu, for an insightful session. While AI's potential to transform how we live and work has been widely explored, a thin evidence base means industry executives remain less clear about how to navigate uncertainties associated with AI design, development, and implementation. Our next session will offer an overview of how Google is using AI to power some of their planet scale applications that touch over 1 billion plus users each. How are they helping other organizations realize the full potential of AI and their latest technology innovations that make these fascinating applications of AI possible? Let us welcome Ms. Seema Ramchandra, Head of Specialist Customer Engineering, Digital Natives, Google Cloud to share more insights with us. Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder, we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the workshop so you can keep posting your questions and our speakers will be happy to take them. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Seema. I'm the specialist customer engineering leader. I head specialist customer engineering for digital natives in India. That consists of a team of experts in data analytics and AI. It is therefore my privilege to talk about this topic that Google is absolutely exceptional at and a topic that is very, very dear to my heart personally. So the topic that we're going to cover today is applied AI. You already heard from Mr. Venugopal about some of the really cool applications that he has seen of AI in uh, the industries that his he works for for his customers. So what we're going to cover today is uh, to give you a little bit of a glimpse of how we at Google have been using AI for various consumer applications, which we operate at planet scale. And then I can take you through uh, the industry perspective of this to say, if you're looking at business applications, then what are the sort of uh, AI applications that we're seeing our customers adopt from Google Cloud? Um, then there is the whole problem of, all right, we understand AI, we're trying to do a few things with AI, but how do we really scale? So understanding MLOps and understanding what Google has to offer uh, around MLOps and how we are able to do it at the scale that we do is some of the perspective that I'd love to share today with all of you. Moving on, so it's well known that Google is an AI company uh, by DNA. So if you look at all of our uh, 10 plus planet scale applications that we have here, each with a billion plus users, AI is truly at the heart of several of these applications. And this is not a recent phenomenon for us. Um, as you can see on the graph on the left hand side, um, I haven't captured the last couple of years, but clearly from 2012 to 2017, just a 15, just a five year period that you see there, there's been a tremendous increase in our investment in the number of AI projects that we run. And we've clocked easily over an 8,000 projects as we stand today. So that's just the number of AI projects we work on internally at Google. 
And let me give you a few um, relatable snippets of where you might have seen this at work so that you can ease into this topic and then cover the more complex issues around scaling. So if you pick up an Android phone um, and use Google Photos, you would have taken photos of a vast variety of things. It could be people, it could be places, it could be things. And uh, the way we're trying to use AI is if you look at the recent uh, launches that have happened on photos, you can do a thematic search. So as you see on this screen, um, I've got several photos of several different things and people and places, but when I type dogs, it's accurately able to pick up just the dog pictures that I have and flash it up. Um, what was also astounding for me personally is that I had a picture of my newborn, which is like 11 years ago now. And I had some pictures of uh, the daughter as she stands now, which is 11 years later. And Photos was able to correlate both of these exceptionally well. Um, it once gave me this prompt on my screen to say, is this the same person? And I was actually quite freaked out that it was able to relate a newborn picture with um, how the person might have evolved 11 years later. So that is the power of image recognition, one of the key parts of our uh, AI offerings that's at work with Google Photos. Another good example that many of you would be able to relate to, you have used Gmail and you will see that as you receive an email, there are prompts that appear at the bottom that indicate what your response might be. So for example, you look at these blocks, somebody has messaged to say, have you had a chance to go through these reports? And it's able to understand and grasp the intent of it and the meaning of it, the semantics of it. And it's able to suggest what could be potential meaningful responses to provide. So you could just click on working on it now. And then if you wanna type anything else, you type that out and send it out. So the point I'm trying to make is AI is at the heart of um, some of these consumer applications that have been adopted by billions of people and has impacted lives. So uh, here is another really good example of how we're helping people understand things that they might not otherwise because they speak a different language. So let's say uh, a non-English speaking person visits a country where English is the primary language and they see a board like this that says exit. All they would need to do is to pick up their phone and click um, an image of this. Uh, it, our AI at the back end is able to pick that up, translate it to different languages that the user might be familiar with, and therefore the user is able to read, although he, he or she cannot read that language necessarily. That's another great example of um, AI at work. Uh, another example that's very relatable on the consumer application side is when it comes to our Chrome browser. So if you just try to go to a random website like example.com, you will see that the browser grasps the fact that this might be an unsafe website and it's able to flash up a warning like this that says deceptive site ahead, you really wanna go there. Um, so that is a way of using AI to make our browsers safer for our users. And what you see in this middle picture is um, semantic aggregation of pages that I might have visited based on topics of interest. So let's say I'm interested in travel, I'm interested in science, I love books, I love AI, and I've visited pages related to each of these topics. Um, and I've visited several pages over the course of a week or so, and then once I shut down my laptop, it's all gone. But when I get back on, I want to be able to pick up the threads and say, what is it that I visited that was related to books? So you're able to topically aggregate that history of page visit information. And as you see here, it's flashing up just the pages that you visited that were related to travel, for example. Another great example of how Chrome is using AI is on the right side of the slide. Uh, let's say you're a person who's commuting in a cab and, um, or you're a person who loves to drink your tea in the morning, reading a few things on your phone, and that's when you might wanna share links. While if you're commuting on a cab trying to read this, you might just want to go with a voice search to see what you can find. So the icons here for share, or do you wanna do a speed search, is sort of contextually switching based on things like what the browser understands of the user's 
device of access, time of day, and things like that. So this is another great example of how we're making our browsers a lot more useful for our users. I'll leave you with a final example on the consumer application side of how Google is using AI. You would have heard of Imagine. So Imagine is um, our AI model at work, which can really help you build an image based on a textual description that you provide. That has, of course, been built upon uh, further by OpenAI now, and it's released as DALI. Um, uh, so Imagen uh, basically uses uh, what is known as a diffusion model. So it's able to disaggregate images into these tiny pixels and then reconstruct images based on bringing those pixels together. So for example, if I just type a cat on a couch, this is the kind of image that you see on the left-hand side that you get. Um, while what you see on the right-hand side is a slightly different AI model, it's called Party. What Party does is it's able to take a collection of images and break it down into code snippets. And when you put in your text, let's say you put in something like a slot that's holding a treasure chest with some kind of a golden light coming out of its chest, right? Uh, that is broadly a description of what I see there. But just based on that text, it's able to translate that text into those code snippets that I said the collection of images is broken down into. And then it's able to reconstruct those images. So each of these approaches sort of have their different applications. Um, Imogen, for example, if I'm trying to color a black and white image, it could be tremendously useful. Or if I'm trying to improve the resolution of images, it could be tremendously useful. So there are a number of um, image recognition based applications of AI that are absolutely fascinating that we're working on. Moving on a bit from um, consumer applications, I just also wanted to give you a bit of a sneak peek as to what's under the hood as to how Google runs all of this and where have we used AI there under the hood, right? So all of this obviously runs out of our huge data centers. And these data centers uh, do have tremendous energy requirements, as you may know. Uh, Google is committed to clean energy, of course, so uh, we do um, have carbon neutrality built into our philosophy of how we operate our data centers. Still, the data center consumption requirements are immensely regulated by using ML. So you, as you can see in that graph, there is a certain power usage. And when you bring in your ML models to control that, your power usage drops by as much as 15%. And the cooling energy that you would need in your data centers, that can drop by as much as 40%. And you see that when we took the ML controls off, that energy consumption was back. So it's clearly an impact of um, ML to bring in more energy efficiency in our data centers. Moving on to some of the applications of AI in industries that we've seen. Uh, the past two to three years when the pandemic hit us has been truly, truly a stress test time, which um, sort of brought a lot of these AI use cases to the fore. Because while it's stress tested what we could do with AI, it, is, it also undoubtedly catalyzed the adoption of AI. Um, it became a necessity rather than a good to have during these times. So let me give you a classic example of what we've seen with some of our retail customers. Um, they were typically operating in uh, the brick and mortar world. And once the pandemic hit, there was obviously a huge drop in footfalls. They began to rotate their capital from using it to refurbish their stores to possibly attending to customers who might still want to buy from them because they're loyal customers, they like the store, but they want to do it online. Now, these kind of shifts in business models are very hard to do in a short period of time. And that won't have been possible without the use of um, some of the AI applications that were built for retail customers. So there are a number of other standard use cases as well that we've seen uh, in retail, for example, you can use it to do product search. That's again, image recognition at work. Uh, we could use it to do recommendations, AI, which can tell you what are the products you might be interested in. You can use it to do inventory optimization and so on. Another big industry, I'll not cover each of these in the interest of time, but just a couple of examples. Um, if you look at the healthcare industry, it was typically a very in-person way or a mode of delivering healthcare. And what COVID really did was to stress test that and say, can we actually shift that to being more um, telehealth first? So that sort of a shift along with things like 
remote surgeries, robotic assisted surgeries, those picked up a lot in the healthcare space during these years. Another thing that happened, obviously, was um, in the hunt for vaccines, uh, there was tremendous focus on how we do genomics research, how can we really come up with um, a ways to fast track the uh, clinical trials around drugs, um, how can we really scale up manufacturing facilities which can help uh, manufacture these at scale. And they, there, there was tremendous application of AI throughout that journey that we've helped several of our healthcare customers with. On the financial services side, uh, we are seeing some really exciting use cases that are being made possible just because of AI. I'll give you one last example before we move on from this slide. Um, it, earlier, if I were to take a personal loan, I would have to maybe go to a bank, fill in a whole lot of documents, submit my proofs of identification, and then wait a couple of days or maybe a week or so until they can process it and ultimately approve a loan. Today, it actually takes me a minute or two to be able to get a loan. I still do all of these processes that I just mentioned, but it's tremendously simplified because you can do something called EKYC. So it's just about uploading the documents that you need to, and then somebody at the other end is actually using AI algorithms to process those documents and grant loans uh, or other approved loans in record periods of time. So those are some of the really fascinating um, applications that we've seen in some of these key sectors. There are also several applications that we're seeing in some of the new economy companies like content creators, for example. They're using AI to see how uh, you know, they could recommend the right kind of videos to people who are interested to see them. So there are huge business models being built around this and a really cool area to delve deep into. And move on in the interest of time. Um, I just wanted to give you a more technology view of what is enabling those use cases that I just talked about on the previous slide. So here are some examples of the key sort of ML APIs that are being adopted in the industry. Vision AI is a truly cutting edge one. And I wish I could have shown you a demo. This is not a virtual um, event, but if you have an Android phone and you could download Google Lens, it's a very simple thing to try. You can pick up any photo that you might have clicked and Lens would be able to tell you uh, what uh, you know where that was taken or it can show up similar images that other people might have taken there's this example of my family having recently visited niagara and when i uploaded that pic it was able to recognize that as niagara and show me a ton of pictures about niagara so it's pretty fascinating um and there are obviously uh, more useful applications of that than the one that I just described, which was more just for my personal pleasure. But uh, the businesses are adopting Vision AI in a very big way. Um, it is being adopted by manufacturing firms, for instance, where they want to test defects in products. It is being used by um, banks, for example, where they want to process documents, like I just mentioned. And so several applications of Vision AI that we are seeing being uh, increasingly being used by companies across industries. Then there is speech to text and text to speech, more commonly known by the acronyms STT and TTS. So this is really, as the name says, if I could speak something, it converts it into text. And if I type out a text, it's able to talk what I um, just typed out. So these are, uh, we've seen a lot of adoption of this amongst call centers, for example, where, um, and, and it could entirely revolutionize business models, right? Because let's say there's a call center agent that's operating out of a European country, uh, which is a non-English speaking country. And then I know just English, so I try to call and the call gets routed there. I speak in English, which is what I know, but the call center agent is able to see the translation of what I'm saying in real time. Um, so that would help revolutionize business models, like I said, trying to take advantage of uh, costs across geographies, but it's also about the labor pool that you can potentially tap into, the talent pool that you can tap into breaking language barriers. So that's the sort of um, application we've seen with STT and TTS. Natural language AI um, is being used for sentiment analysis vastly. 
uh, trivial example again that's more relatable is if I'm writing book reviews um, and there are let's say hundreds of people like me who've reviewed the book and written something you quickly want to get a grasp of was it positive negative okay-ish and that's the kind of analysis that AI can quickly do for you to grasp the sentiment behind the words that you're feeding it. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's also being used to analyze social media feeds. That's a very obvious application, particularly for B2C businesses that work with us. Then there is video AI. Um, so if I have a video, and we use this all the time with uh, YouTube as well, uh, there's really a lot of intelligence that you can get out of that video. For example, um, are you able to identify what these people are speaking so that you can possibly identify profanity, for example, and have these profanity filters that can remove that sort of content automatically. So that's a great application of AI that we use in our YouTube. Um, there are also ways in which you can extract metadata from that video. That's again, intelligence. If you have a lot of metadata on your video, you can use it to drive recommendations. Then there is translation AI, which allows you to dynamically translate between thousands of languages that the name suggests. So moving on, there are two other big uh, applications, namely document AI, which I briefly covered for EKYC, uh, that being just one of the applications. They could also be invoice parsing or handwriting recognition, for example. Um, so I could briefly uh, cover a demo of that. So currently we are in the Vertex AI. Uh, so if you can scroll down here to the artificial intelligence section, subheading right here, you see that document AI is one of the options that you have. So what you simply do is create a processor, give it a name. So you can choose whether you want a general processor. So if you want just optical character recognition, you can go for this, or you can also use form uh, parsers for if you want to identify checkboxes, et cetera. And we have specialized parsers for, let's say, your, um, um, your loan documents and your tax documents. So especially for all of those, we have uh, a bunch of different parsers that are already available. So you have your bank statement parser, et cetera. So I will just quickly go here for the document parser. Uh, uh, document OCR, call it, let's just say demo, and create it. You can choose the region where okay, it's already there, so demo one. So once you've created uh, a processor, you get these details. And using these details, you can simply call it in your Python code. So that's how easy it is to integrate it. So now to just quickly test this out, let's say I've given this handwritten document. It's analyzing the document. So you see that it could properly read this. Similarly, I can also have a form parser do this. And let's say I put a receipt right here, an invoice. It should be able to detect the different sections. So as you can see, it says sold by blah, 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 my billing address, and so on. So basically, this is how simple it is to get started with your document AI. Now to understand what is happening behind the hood, basically this is a three-step process where you read the data, understand it, and finally make it useful. So um, understanding what happens uh, with Doc AI is similar to how a human interprets these documents. So you read it and then you understand it, and only then you'll be able to use it. And basically the life of this document is that we convert the input PDF or image, etc., which is a PNG, uh, so that the auto um, and whichever a type of document that you have, you convert it to a PNG in image itself. And with auto ML vision, you can classify its type, whether it's patent versus data sheet, etc. If data sheet, the document will be ignored for the next steps. But if not, then we run an OCR with vision API to extract the text from each document. And in parallel to the OCR recognition, we also run natural language. Uh, AI that we talked about earlier to extract these text fields and these entities are then grouped if they are related. So if it's a publication number, etc., they are grouped separately. And we also run uh, AutoML object detection in the background that remember uh, in the AutoML section that we covered to extract these graphs. And these uh, results are stored in BigQuery. 
And finally, we compare the extracted information to the ground truth and compute the accuracy. And once uh, you can also ensure that this entire document, um, uh, the results are outputted in the form and packaged into a document and given back to you. So um, that's essentially document AI for you very quickly. So there is a vast variety of documents that you have in your collection. It could be structured, unstructured. Um, the document AI is really about extracting it. So you read those documents, understand it, and make it useful. Um, you can see an example of that in the demo that was just played. Uh, I will also move on to Reco AI, for which we're seeing a vast adoption across industries, particularly retail, but several others like um, content creators as well. So um, there are challenges in understanding consumer behavior, uh, understanding consumers across different channels, essentially being able to create personalized experiences by following them and resolving their ideas across channels and cataloging all the metadata behind what they're visiting. Uh, there is also a huge need for um, localizing delivery. What does that mean? So there is an element of how you're able to address latency if you are catering to a more local population. And of course, there are local preferences, local languages, et cetera, to take care of. So with all of these considerations, how do you use them to meaningfully recommend the next best product that the customer might be interested in or the next video that they'd want to watch or whatever? So um, this is again an example of an OTT uh, recommendation, right? So um, what I will show you is maybe the quick steps in terms of how you can go about building uh, a recommendation model. So typically what I would do is go over here, uh, search for um, recommendations AI, and that should open, or I can go here. Right? So the way I reach this console is essentially go over here and search for recommendations AI. You will have to enable it. Uh, once you enable it, it will take you to this dashboard, which is essentially uh, the dashboard where uh, you go about building your recommendation AI models, right? Uh, three steps, as I mentioned, you have to upload your data. You have to select um, your model configuration, and then you have to select your serving parameters. Now, just to give you a quick overview of how the data looks. So over here, this is essentially a, a movie ratings kind of a, a example. So this is pretty much suited with regards to an OTT scenario, right? Where you want to recommend uh, a user based on his previous watch history and based on the ratings that he has given to a set of movies as well as ratings given by other users, similar users. So essentially you have a data set, which is your movies and you have a, a data set which is essentially the ratings that is indicative of the user event so movies typically have your movie id your title and the category and that maps to the products so uh, typically movie id translates to id title would be uh, the product description and genre becomes the categories uh, in terms of ratings so these are all your user events so this particular user watched this movie at this particular time and uh, resulted in this kind of a rating, right? So this is essentially the uh, user event history that we have. Um, so two, uh, as you, uh, if you remember from the slide, two sets of data, one is the product catalog, which is your movies. And second is the consumer event history, which is your ratings given by the different users. We translate those into a schema that is acceptable uh, or accepted by the model, essentially a products and user events. So products essentially translates to title and categories. User events would be uh, what was the um, user ID, what kind of event it was, when did that event happen, and for what product it happened. So essentially you are converting that uh, into a schema that is accepted by the uh, platform. Once you have that, you go to your data tab over here then you can start uploading your uh, product catalog so if i go here and if i say import 
I have the option I'm importing the product catalog. In this case, it is the movie database. Uh, I can import it from all these different sources. I would select BigQuery in this case, uh, and then I can give the uh, path of the BigQuery table where my product resides, right? So in this case, it would be the products uh, database. I have already imported it. So there are about 58,000 movies in, in my case. The next thing that I would do is import the events. So I would go over here, uh, user events. I can import it from cloud storage or BigQuery. In this case, I would import it from BigQuery. It is the user event schema. I can browse and I would then go to the user events table that I have created and then I would upload that here. So I have already uploaded that here as well. So there are about 13 million events. For every movie, there is about 372 ratings that I have received. This is the history of the events that have happened over time, right? So I can take a quick look at all those things. Um, I can also see across how many days those events are present. Uh, is every rating having a corresponding product? Uh, if not, then I will see some error over here, in which case there are user events for which there is no corresponding product. But in this case, there is a perfect match. So I'm seeing like 0% unjoined events. Once I have that, I can go to the models tab. I can click on create a model. It would ask me what kind of model I want to create. As we saw all those different types in terms of what other products you may like, depending on what you have already selected, what are the frequently bought items recommended for you. So I can select all uh, the kind of recommendation that I want to build, the business objective that I want to optimize, and then I can click on create, in which case the model starts training. It spends about, uh, I think uh, this model was built in a couple of days, but typically we say it's two to five days uh, of training, depending on the data that you may have. And once you have that, then you can go about creating us. Once you have a model, you can go about creating a server config, uh, in which case I can select a record. Server config is how you expose it as an API. So I can give a random name here. I can select a model. And I can select the preferences. So if, if I want to rank it based on price, uh, if I want to in, uh, include diversification, all those options I can select over here and then I can uh, click on create in which case a rest endpoint is created for me around the model, uh, applying all these additional filters as well. And once it is available uh, as uh, a serving config, I can start consuming it and I can also evaluate it um, using this interface over here. Uh, like for example, if I want to add 853, this is a, um, so I am a user, I'm adding a movie that I have already watched. Let's maybe add one more, uh, okay. And then I can take a look at all the predictions that are relevant to me as well, right? So it would probably show me uh, movies that are relevant to what I have already added in this case, right? So uh, this is a quick example of how you can also evaluate your uh, recommendations. Uh, you can use this dashboard in terms of also monitoring your model performance, if there are any errors, latencies and all that. So right now I don't have a very heavy traffic, so this is all blank but uh, you have the option of uh, monitoring your uh, recommendations using this dashboard as well. So that was a quick whirlwind demo of recommendations. So having covered a whole lot around possible applications of AI and some of them are just super exciting ones in the consumer space, others are very exciting ones in the business space. I'll quickly move on to another bleakier side of the picture possibly and this is it right um, if you actually look at ai adoption you'll see that 87 percent of data science pilots actually never make it to production so they're great science experiments but they remain that um, and throughout 2022 85 percent of ai projects were said to be delivering erroneous outcomes so um there is you know in a sense a uh, number of hurdles, there are in a sense a number of hurdles to adopting AI at scale. Some of those I've tried to summarize on the right side. So there's a dearth of quality data, so it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, there is also an element of culture because if people are 
so used to manually doing things, AI comes in and changes all of that. How do you really navigate those kind of mindsets? How do you build the relevant skills for AI to truly make its impact at scale? And some of the operational issues around being able to scale AI and the technical issues behind it, which I'll cover in greater depth in the coming slides. So in a sense, if you have to productionize ML models, that is go beyond your pilot phase or a POC phase and actually make it uh, capable of serving inferences to a larger audience, then you need to do a lot more than actually just getting your ML code right. So as you can see, there's an element of having to collect the right data, manage that, get it to the right quality levels, do your feature engineering right, um, train that model. And also once you deploy, there's an element of monitoring it constantly so that those all familiar drifts don't creep in and your models continue to be accurate and they're retrained periodically, automatically. So that is what would constitute um, the entirety of what makes for ML adoption at scale. So how do we do that? There is an emerging field of interest around ML ops to address precisely that. Software engineering has been around for the longest time uh, addressing a very similar concept of scalable systems deployment. So what we really do is borrow the best practices and principles from software engineering, like your CI CD, for example, um, and then marry it with what it takes to do things on the ML side, which could be your model development, deployment, your prototyping, and so on. And then there is the whole element of building the data pipeline that actually feeds into that model, which is a whole um, field around data engineering. So bringing these together is what MLOps really is. So if you look at these broad phases of um, developing an ML model and deploying it, which is you know to train it, continuously train it, deploy it, serve the predictions and monitor it like I just described, um, you could be operating in one of these three levels. Either you're doing a lot of things manually, or there is a certain degree of automation that you're trying to bring into your ML pipeline. Or the most mature is when you're actually able to bring in those CI, CD pipeline automation principles in order to make your ML pipeline so well oiled and so auto um, pilot that you don't really have a lot of admin overhead doing this at all manually. So this is what it could look like. Um, so there's an experimentation phase in a staging pre prod or prod phase that I'm dividing it into here. And you'll see that the job of preparing the data, training it, evaluating it is all very manual in this first level of maturity. And then it goes to the deployment phase. Whereas in the next level of maturity, you're able to automate a lot of these things like validation to data preparation to training evaluation um, is more like an orchestrated experiment that you run. And then there is a source repository where you can actually store these models. And when you have to deploy this pipeline here, you have sort of a similar automated pipeline that runs and um, you have a performance monitoring mechanism that's built in to continuously monitor this entire automated pipeline that you've just created. Um, now, in the most mature level, uh, where we've seen a few customers really make the leaps in the last couple of years with us, uh, you see that this is not just completely automated, but you see this whole element of CI, which is build, test, and package your pipeline components, and CD, which is you deploy your pipelines, built into this flow of things. So you not only have an automated pipeline, which can at once deploy a model for you, but you also have a loop that you've established, which constantly improves and constantly uh, makes sure that the best of your models are deployed and monitored. So how do you in reality do all of this? Conceptually, it's great, but there are really three ways to build your ML models with Google. Um, we offer something called Vertex AI, and there is also AutoML, and there is BQML. So BigQuery is by far um, our most successful warehouse product that many of you may be familiar with. And if you are, then all you need is SQL skills to be able to use ML on BigQ. So that's an easy option. The next level of maturity is where uh, you possibly have a problem that fits into one of the types of problems that AutoML supports. So you just have a sort of a no code uh, click, a uh, point and click sort of a workflow based on which you can use these ML models. 
Um, then there is Vertex, where if you have to build the sort of pipelines that I just described, that's where you can use a platform like Vertex AI. So what Vertex really gives you um, is you are able to put models in production a lot faster. Remember the first graph that I started with, where we said we had 10,000 projects literally around um, AI. Um, so if we are to do something like that, it's only possible if we have this sort of a mature pipeline management system. So it increases your velocity with which you can put models in production, essentially. You also get access to Google's best in class algorithms all as a service. You're able to scale your ML workflows much beyond that pilot or POC that you're trying to do. And there are inbuilt elements to manage and help govern your models. This is broadly um, how it happens, or here are the broad components within Vertex AI that make it all possible. So you do see these modules around uh, model monitoring, for example. Um, there are, of course, the notebooks and pipelines, which are basic building blocks. But once you deploy, um, what makes this truly efficient in terms of pipeline management is things like monitoring, uh, being able to use a feature store through which you can create features, share it with other data scientists who are working, so you don't have to create things from scratch each time. You also have things like Vizier, which cuts down your necessity to manually tune hyperparameters, uh, manually write a lot of code. So all of that gets cut down tremendously with Vizier, which automates a lot of those things for you. I'll just skip a bit of this in the interest of time. Um, so here's an example of feature store that I was talking about. You can share and reuse your ML features across different use cases. Uh, you can also use this to create your training and serving SKU because your features are stored in the feature store and you can dip into that each time. Um, <clears throat> Then there is this element of uh, proactive monitoring where you have a way to assess model health uh, periodically and not let those drifts creep in or retrain models when those drifts creep in automatically. Then there is, uh, let's say you're running a series of experiments, right? Which is very common when you're building a model, you have several experiments that you're running and you wanna compare them against a standardized set of metrics that you've set in place. Vizio, uh, sorry, uh, Vertex AI offers a way to track them all in a single dashboard where you can have all the experiments listed against all of the metrics, as you can see here. So this is a really neat platform to build and manage your ML pipelines. I won't drain the depth of a lot of this, but I'll quickly wind up with some of the benefits uh, that you might want to take note of with Vertex. So Vizier that I was talking about, which lets you automatically tune hyperparameters, for example, and some of the things that it does to optimize is if you're running a model and let's say early on you get an indication that this is not quite going to be as accurate a model, you won't have to necessarily progress those to completion before you can come and try something else, right? So that is the sort of predictive capability that's built into Vertex Vizier, which lets it kill those uh, candidate runs the moment you know that they're suboptimal. So what that does is you have 80% fewer trials that you're running than traditional methods. It's a huge, huge saving in terms of time and cost. It also requires 80% fewer lines of code to train a model. And um, you see that you know, just the proof of the pudding that I put out here is that Vertex was able to increase Google Cloud's internal team's rate of experimentation to nearly 1,000 candidate models a day. And we were using this on some of our COVID-19 public forecasts, and the accuracy went up by a whopping 50% in about nine months. Mm -hmm. So that's where I will stop, and I hope this session was useful to all of you and a pretty interesting one. Thanks so much and happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramachandra. Now it's time for the Q&A round. We will try to take the maximum questions as the time permits. Thank you, Ms. Seema. Now it's time for the Q&A round. We'll try to take the maximum questions as the time permits. Now let's take a few questions from the audience. Our first question is for Mr. Venu Ram Gopal. Uh, can large businesses only gain from applications of AI? 
Thanks, Hani, for the question. Um, I think it's a good question. So large organizations, I don't know why there is any question around large organization, be it large or small. If you do AI the right way and use the AI models the right way, any organization will be successful. The way I would put it across is there are three to four basic things that we need to keep in mind. First is AI alignment. Across the organization, across different departments, whether all the stakeholders are brought in place, right? Uh, sometimes this makes very difficult to maneuver. The second one is focus on the data quality. Being a large organization, data quality is critical and you need to be focusing on that. Where my data sources are, how do I tie different things together? And how do I make sense out of the data? That is very critical for you to model it. The third one, actually, I was more focused on the modeling, right? What algorithms that I'm going to use. It need not be accurate on day one, but uh, you know, you got to have the right scoping activities done and you need to ensure that what is that you are expecting and how much data you need to run it past. And uh, that is critical. You need to start small, but somewhere you need to start it. Last but not the least, agile way of doing things uh, helps a lot when it comes to AI because there's a lot of learning, tuning is needed. Uh, so I would recommend these four elements to be included in any large organization's AI-related initiatives. Okay. Uh, our next question is for Ms. Seema. Uh, how Google is using the responsible AI? Do you enforce any checks while using AI APIs? Absolutely. And thanks for the question. It's an important one, although it doesn't get talked about as much with um, a lot of the Indian companies that we work for around AI projects. Uh, Google is absolutely serious about responsible and ethical AI. This is a huge area of research within Google. We have some clearly laid out principles for what constitutes our responsible AI dimensions. So, for example, we have guidelines that clearly state AI should be, uh, you know, when I say AI, it's really all of the AI projects that we work on. Every single one of them goes through these checks to say, is it socially beneficial? Is it avoiding uh, creating or reinforcing an unfair bias? Um, are we actually building it and testing it for safety? Um, do we hold people uh, accountable to what they're building? And are you, for example, incorporating privacy design principles in whatever you're building? Um, so there are a whole lot of these principles that say what AI should be. And then similarly, we also have guidelines that say what kind of applications we will not pursue. So we will never pursue applications which are likely to cause overall harm, um, applications which could have something to do with weapons or those that have some direct injury potential. Uh, those are the kind of projects that would never make it past these kind of tests. Um, there is also a guideline around uh, use of surveillance, for example. It should not violate internationally accepted norms, and it should not be contrary to international law or human rights laws. So there are a clear set of uh, principles, like I said, and the broad dimensions that we care about under responsible AI are we care that our AI is fair is safe, secure, um, pays respect to privacy, transparency, it's robust, and it's explainable and interpretable, not just a black box where something goes in, something comes out, and you have no idea why. So those broadly are some of the guidelines that we have around responsibility, and every single one of the projects that we do goes through a strong um, review mechanism where it's reviewed against each of these principles. Thanks for that. Uh, our next question we have for Mr. Venugopal. Uh, could you share some use cases of AI in lending customer service? How does it help startups versus large companies? Great. So, so lending customer service, right? So I think lending industry is one of the big business in the, in the market. And, uh, you know, there has been a lot of financial losses in the past. And uh, people and the banks and lending industries tried to cope up with many ways of addressing it. Many use cases, and I've seen um, many banks and credit industry um, leveraging AI. So a few things I can think of is obviously, first is identify who's the borrower, 
that is very critical whom you are going to lend the money to right that's super critical and how do you get that you know ai does the magic there you know with all the data that is getting collected across the digital footprints people leave banks are using it credit industry is using that right and use the data collate it identify who is the right borrower it look it can also help in identifying the credit worthiness of who you are lending to and is there any credit risk involved so ai use cases ai can help in all these use cases there also one of the interesting article that i was reading recently about banking and lending industry leveraging ai for underwriting as well right how do i address it and what kind of terms and conditions that has been accepted and what are the underwriting rules that we need to follow and stuff like that so those places also absolutely ai is picking up and banks have been leveraging it um, last but not the least right how do you reduce the financial loss so ai use cases can help stitch the end to end story identify the right borrower credit risk credit worthiness of the person whoever is lending and connect all these dots together so that you can get an end to end view so that your your lending is you know successful okay next question is for you masima uh, where do we start calling the technology ai versus let's say a complex code which can churn a large amount of data and draw inferences from that interesting one we talked a lot about applied ai and though this question is relatively a theoretical one i think it's a really interesting one um so artificial intelligence was called artificial because it was meant to simulate human intelligence which by definition is you know something that involves learning something that involves reasoning judgment those are the kind of things that you typically think uh, a human should do right so uh, ai was deemed to Uh, include everything that was going to simulate all of this but eventually as i think machines became more and more capable that definition does require a revisit and it has been revisited so for example technologies like ocr right that's a classic example of what was once deemed to be within the umbrella of ai the vast range of technologies that make up ai but today it's a huge debate as to whether ocr is truly ai at all because eventually it's just about recognizing a set of characters and reading it like a human does so there is no learning or judgment uh, maybe that's something that's more taken for granted as machines become more capable so yeah so to your point i think um, the definition was there for a purpose but it is evolving just as the technology is okay uh, next question is again for you uh, can you share some examples of how maps can be leveraged in ai and ml use cases Oh sure it's a fascinating topic um uh, personally one that I-, i love talking about it's the spatial data complex to deal with so uh, there are a variety of use cases that have come across when maps is used and one of the most fascinating ones by far is something called earth engine that was launched by google last year and uh, this is interesting because it it brings together a variety of ai technologies uh, to make it possible and blends it very beautifully with maps so for example i can go take the picture of crops that are being grown in a farm and image recognition can recognize what kind of crop it is and which location it is then i can bring in weather data to say in that location now that i know which location it is can i forecast whether there's going to be an adverse natural event for example or is rainfall going to be just as it should be for that season of the year and that will have an impact on the crop that i'm growing in that farm so i can use the historical data i have about what crop requires what kind of climate to then say now that i know that this is the prediction around weather can i actually predict whether there's going to be a crop failure or a crop surplus or is it all going to be fine so i think there are several interesting use cases that emanate from that to say how is your demand supply match going to look like in some time very fascinating um some of the other examples i can think of are obviously around uh, use of maps for route optimization so if you're doing delivery of several different parcels uh, how can you really optimize particularly your last mile delivery Uh, to make sure that you take into account different things like your package sizes the locations um, availability of customers at specific times and so on 
So yeah, a variety of use cases that use maps and bring it together beautifully with AI. Uh, one more question around AI and ML. How can logistics providers leverage AI and ML? Oh, yes. So apart from the route optimization of the last mile delivery that I just talked about, uh, we've seen logistics providers use AI in really innovative ways. So for example, in large scale logistics provider companies, you'd have these conveyor belts where parcels get sorted based on what they are carrying, whether they're fragile items and where they need to get delivered to and so on, right? So as parcels move along that conveyor belt, there's several things could go wrong. Um, there could be breakages, spillages, and things like that. So can you actually look at a camera feed and detect those without having to have a person who's manually manning the line every single second of the day? Um, so that is something that we're doing around visual inspection. And sometimes what could also happen is that if there is these kind of breakages or spillages, it just ends up clogging your conveyor belt and all of your other parcels get stuck there and there's a huge delay. So there is a huge business impact to uh, some of these use cases. The other thing that I've also seen with logistics providers, well, uh, when I say logistics, maybe it's more specifically in the area of grocery delivery, for example. Um, so if somebody returns an order, it's a huge, huge cost to the business. So they try their best to avoid that by making sure that whatever fruit or vegetable this person is picking for delivery is truly of the highest quality, not likely to get returned. Now, how do you do that? The person can actually click an image, upload it, and then there's a sorting and grading algorithm that can work at the back end to really tell you whether this is a, an order that's likely to get returned or not. So yeah, I think some very interesting applications that are coming out of the logistics space. Okay, uh, next question is for both of you. You can take one by one. Uh, what are some best practices to address common pitfalls that companies face in scaling AI and ML? So, uh, Mr. Venugopal, you can go first. Okay. Yeah, so I'll go first. So, so I think scaling AI First, you know, I think this is sort of aligned with the, one of the questions that I got earlier. How the large businesses be successful, right? So I think I would repeat the same thing, uh, right? So first is scaling AI. First is please ensure that you have the right amount of alignment within the organization. Second one is the data quality. Often, you know, you keep hearing that, you know, even when Seema was talking about earlier, garbage in and garbage out, right? Uh, so you need to ensure that you have the right amount of data quality. So a lot of data engineers and data science specialists are required, right? Uh, to ensure that you get the right amount of data. And it, it you can train the people. It need not be that, you know, you, these guys are born from some other planet or something like that, right? So. Nowadays, I'm seeing many organizations are training uh, their employees in data science uh, programs, data engineering programs. So I think that needs to happen within the ecosystem. How do I turn my existing employees to nurture and cultivate the data in a better form so that I can use it for my AI? And obviously, once you have the right amount of data, you know, have the right engineers, data science engineers, to help you model it. And as I was saying earlier, you know, this is the right time to start. And Seema gave wonderful examples, use cases as well. Uh, and this is a time where the organizations needs to align themselves, find the accountability, find the right matrix to ensure that who does what, and clearly call out and connect all these people together so that, you know, you have a uh, you know, a, a successful AI program and scaling of AI program in the organization. Last but not the least, uh, you know, in the past, uh, every time when there is an IT program that used to run, we used to have a, a group called Design Authority. And, you know, there's a central group that manages uh, the IT programs uh, to ensure that the rollout, everything is successful. So in my view, Anything to do with AI also, you need to bring different people together under one authority. The AI authority within an organization is also critical. Once these things are aligned, I think scaling up is, is will eventually happen. Any additional comments to this, Yusima? 
Sure, yeah, I'll just chip in with a couple of pointers around uh, if somebody is looking to get started with AI, particularly what are some pitfalls we've seen. Um, first thing I would say is don't quite go around asking what can AI do for me or what is the technology capable of. The right question to ask really is what is the business problem I'm trying to solve? Um, the technology can do several things, but uh, just because it can, you shouldn't have to take it up. Um, it would be much more beneficial to go about it um, from a problem standpoint to say, what am I trying to solve for? The second thing around talent, I think Venu made a really good point to say, yes, the skill, uh, there's a severe dearth of the skill, but that need not deter you from uh, really adopting AI because particularly with the evolution of technology, there's several things that have come up, like the BQML, for instance, that I talked about. You really need nothing other than six skills to be able to get started with ML. So the technology is there, the dumbed down technology is there, the very adoptable technology is there. So you needn't really sweat it out trying to say, let me you know, scale up an army of people before I can get started. It's, it's really low hanging fruit at this time. It's no more uh, the holy grail of data scientists and esoteric skills, skill sets like that. So that's the other. The final thing I'd probably leave you with is, uh, if you're looking to figure out what kind of technology you want to start with when you get to AI and where you invest in, uh, perhaps it's worth trying to avoid the temptation to just compare product feature to product feature, price to price, and then pick what you want. Uh, take a more long-term view to it and see whether these vendors you're considering have actually done it at scale and are capable of rolling out AI at scale. That's critical because, like I mentioned in the presentation, more than 87% of projects just go to cold storage after a pilot. They never see the light of the day. So being able to scale is a critical skill for whoever you partner with. Uh, next question is again for you, uh, Masima. Are there any horizontal AI and ML use cases apart from document passing and recommendations that are applicable across multiple industries? Great question. Um, so we did cover industry specific use cases and it's quite easy to think of because uh, AI is very close to the business and when you try to solve a business problem, it's undoubtedly specific to that domain. But there are a few that stand out that I think uh, can be applied across industries. For instance, um, call centers is something that most companies run and can we have AI to provide the intelligence as that's required to run a call center more cost efficiently? Uh, for example, can I prompt agents through knowledge articles on what's the next best thing that they can recommend to the customer? Can I have a voice bot maybe take off some of the load from an agent so that you don't really have to staff up agents to run a call center at the scale that we currently do. So there are several such innovations that we're exploring around call centers. It's a specific offering that Google has around just call center AI. It's a suite in itself. Um, then I think there are also some interesting applications around what Venu just mentioned about data quality. So typically data has been looked upon as the feeder into AI. I would challenge that a little bit and say, can we also look at uh, application of AI to cleanse data in the first place. Um, so the, it is clearly a learning model where you can figure out where to do your missing value implants or where to sort of extrapolate data from what you have and so on. So I think that's an interesting application that's also applicable across industries. Uh, maybe one more that occurs to me is around predictive maintenance, right? Um, so if, whether it is a fleet of trucks that you're trying to monitor because you're a logistics provider, or if you're, let's say, an IT hardware company that's trying to monitor your whole server base that you have around the world, and you're trying to proactively predict what may fail and take action before it actually fails. Or it could be oil rigs for an oil and gas company. They're trying to remotely monitor it and uh, fix equipment before it can fail. So in all of these cases, uh, you know, predictive maintenance is the common thread where AI has a huge role to play. It's just different kinds of equipment you're monitoring, but the logic and the flow and the algorithm is all quite similar. Uh, next question is again for both of you. If I have to invest on AI, what should I be focusing on? Any low hanging stuff I can explore? Venu, uh, if you would like to take it first. Yeah, okay, maybe uh, I'll go first, Venu. Sure. So it, it depends on uh, where in the life cycle of AI adoption the company is possibly. So if I'm looking to 
start out small company trying to get my first few AI projects right, I'd probably look at investing in just about packaged services that are available, not trying to build everything myself from scratch, but things like document AI, for example, are just consumable through an API call. So I'd probably start there. While if it is somebody who's hired up the adoption curve and they're actually operating tens of different uh, AI models at scale, then we'd look at investing in getting your pipelines right and scalable, maybe having a platform which can help you with that whole end-to-end governance process that's required after you deploy the model. So yeah, I think areas of investment might differ depending on where you are at with that adoption journey and what kind of use cases you're pursuing really. Uh, any comments, Mr. Venu? Yeah, yeah, a couple of points from my end. Um, the first is, yeah, you know, for, you know, this is an evolving space and you don't have to really boil the ocean. Um, there are many, you know, low code, no code platforms available, drag and drop, you know, you, you, you are done with that actually. Even I personally do a lot of things just by dragging and dropping in some of the Google applications itself, especially when it comes to AI. So I think the this is something that's a low hanging thing that you know the organizations can try. You don't have to build a pile of talent, I invest on people and so on and so forth, right? To do that. And second thing is, you know, to Second pointer is about, you know, I spoke about data quality earlier, even Seema spoke about data quality, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. AI and data quality is a symbiotic relationship. So AI enhances the data quality and data quality enhances the AI. So as long as you use some simpler, easy to use tools, you can start the journey with now I'm sure your adoption and your data quality, everything will start improving. So then, you know, eventually you'll be successful in your AI program. Be clear in terms of what exactly you want to achieve out of AI. Don't do just because my competition is doing it. Please be clear on your business goals, identify it, and then start with some of the beautiful solutions out there in the market. You know, I'm sure you'll be able to get Okay, uh, next question is for you, Seema. What about training? Uh, does Google have any bootstrap course to get my team onboarded on this? Oh, absolutely. Google made a huge commitment to the market saying we want to train 40 million people. No, I didn't get a zero wrong. 40 million people is our ambition on cloud skills. Uh, this was uh, a statement that we went to the market with around October last year, and the commitment has remained super high ever since. So we have about 700 plus hands-on labs and courses that were released at that time. They were made uh, free for all for about a month's time. And uh, people who registered at that time continue to get access to these, but you could also register now. There are also a number of free courses that we make available to our customers on a monthly basis. Um, and those are mostly fundamentals that are great to start learning with. But if you do want to get deeper into this domain, um, I would strongly suggest checking out our professional certifications. So the AI ML engineer certification is one that's very pertinent to this field. Okay. Uh, let's take one more question. This is for Venu. Uh, data quality is always an issue. How to go about this? Yeah, as I said earlier, um, you know, it is work on your sources, what exactly your source, which is providing the data, clean it as much as possible. You know, you got to have the data engineers either trained or hired. And again, right, don't get too much into the data quality stuff. As I said in my previous response, it's a symbiotic relationship. Start somewhere and then over time, the engine gets tuned. AI will not be accurate on day one, right? You got to tune it, you got to feed it, keep tuning it, and this will happen, right? And that's how the model is also working. So that's how I would address the data quality. Uh, don't get stuck to it. And uh, it is evolving and people are moving and uh, the quality will improve once the AI comes into place. It's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, so that was the last question. We, as time uh, does not allow us to take more questions.
I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you have got answers to all your questions. Uh, thank you to our esteemed speakers for this insightful content and your valuable time. Uh, thank you to our audience for being interactive and patient. And finally, thanks to Google Cloud for this collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, keep following ETCIO for all the latest updates and upcoming events. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.